Blue Origin brings new blend to its launch pad, NASA picks new landing sites for Artemis 3, the European Space Agency wants reusable rockets, Voyager 1 is experiencing more issues, and is anyone interested in buying Starliner? All that and so much more happened this week in Spaceflight. The European Space Agency has selected four companies to work on the technology needed for reusable rockets. Earlier this year, the agency asked for proposals for high-performance engines and reusable rocket booster concepts, and ESA has now announced the winners for these contests. Two companies were selected as the winners for the Technologies for High Thrust Reusable Space Transportation Initiative, or THRUST for short. With this project, ESA sought proposals to develop and demonstrate high-thrust staged combustion engines. The first winner under the Thrust initiative is the German company Rocket Factory Augsburg. RFA is currently working on its rocket, called RFA-1, which is powered by the company's own Helix engines. While that engine does use a staged combustion cycle, it's likely not quite powerful enough to be considered for the Thrust initiative. Unfortunately, we don't know the details of RFA's proposal, but it seems the company has something even bigger in the works. The other company selected for the Thrust Initiative is the Exploration Company. This company has roots in both France and Germany and is currently working on a reusable cargo spacecraft called Nix. Alongside this, the company is also developing a methane-powered staged combustion engine called Typhoon. This engine is designed to provide 200 tons of thrust and is therefore also likely what the Exploration Company pitched for this initiative. Typhoon already received funding from the French space agency Kness last year, and back then, the engine was expected to be operational by 2030. Two other companies received an award under the BEST initiative, and that's short for Boosters for European Space Transportation. As the name suggests, this initiative focuses on reusable rocket boosters. The German company ESAR Aerospace was one of the winners. ESAR is currently getting ready for the first launch of its Spectrum rocket, however this rocket is currently not planned to be reusable, so the company has likely proposed an upcoming and larger vehicle for the best initiative. The last winner is the French Ariane Group, the company that's been the backbone of the European space industry for a long time. Interestingly, this is the only one in the bunch that's publicly known to already work on reusable vehicles. Firstly, the company is working on Themis, a prototype for a reusable rocket that's expected to fly next year. But the Ariane Group has also started a subsidiary called Maya Space, which is fully focused on developing reusable rockets. The winners for the BEST initiative will be presented at the ESA Council at Ministerial level next year, which will then make funding decisions. The next step for the four companies is to begin contract negotiations with ESA, so it will still be a while before we see the projects deliver any results. Nonetheless, it's great to see ESA finally adopting reusability, and we can't wait to see some European rockets land. If you want to stay in the loop with these reusable rockets and other space news, make sure to subscribe and ring the bell to get notified when we publish new episodes. And if you like our spaceflight updates, there's a button just for that too! Boeing might be looking to sell Starliner. No, it's not looking for customers who want to buy a ticket and fly on board the capsule. Rather, it wants to sell the entire program to another company. Earlier this year, we followed the capsule's first crewed flight test. Unfortunately, that flight was fraught with thruster issues and eventually returned without its crew. That was only one of the many problems that the company's been dealing with recently. Boeing's airplane division has been plagued with issue after issue, and failed negotiations with union workers have halted production of most of their new aircraft. Altogether, the different problems across the company mean that it's now, not surprisingly, facing financial problems. To veer off the financial headwinds, Boeing's new CEO, Kelly Ortberg, is now looking to streamline the company. As part of that strategy, Boeing is reportedly seeking buyers for Starliner and the company division that supports NASA's operations at the International Space Station. Interestingly, it seems that the company wants to keep its satellite business and its division working on NASA's Space Launch System, or SLS. It's unclear who would be interested in buying Starliner, though. Some have speculated that Blue Origin might be a potential buyer. Last year, Blue was also expected to buy the United Launch Alliance, but that did not come to fruition. Unfortunately, Boeing is not the only company with an important role in the ISS's future to face financial problems. It seems that Axiom Space is not doing too well either. While Boeing has been working on the ISS since the beginning, Axiom is expected to play an important role in the space station's future and even beyond. The company is developing a commercial successor that will start its life attached to the ISS. 
This would guarantee continuous human presence in orbit after the ISS is retired in 2030. However, that new station is now believed to be downsized from four modules to two as a result of financial problems. What's more, the company is also developing a lunar spacesuit for NASA and offering commercial missions to the ISS on SpaceX's Dragon. All of these projects are very costly, and it's been reported that Axiom still has outstanding payments to SpaceX. If the company no longer is able to fund these programs and pay the bills, many current and future space programs worldwide will have to change gears very quickly. We certainly hope that that won't be necessary and that both Axiom and Boeing can get their financials in order quickly. And now we'll take a quick glimpse at some other stories across space, starting with Perseverance, which witnessed a solar eclipse on Mars. This week, NASA released this clip of Phobos passing in front of the sun. As Percy took these images on September 30th, it was also traversing very challenging terrain. The rover has been climbing up the western wall of Jezero Crater for a while, and it has now encountered some incredibly steep and slippery terrain. Percy has tackled steep terrain and slippery terrain before, but only individually. This time, it has to deal with the combination of a 20 degree incline and a slippery surface at the same time, and that has slowed down the rover by 50%. Not to be deterred, Percy captured a panoramic view of Jezero Crater halfway up the slope. The image not only shows locations the rover visited previously, but also the terrain and the tracks left by Percy's slipping wheels. NASA wants to get Percy up Jezero's rim as soon as possible, so teams have tested some ways to deal with the terrain, ultimately deciding on a slightly less slippery path along the northern edge of its planned route. This should get Percy to its destination within a few weeks. Going from Mars to our own celestial companion, NASA has updated the list of potential landing locations for humanity's return to the moon. The refined list now contains nine potential landing regions for Artemis III, all located near the lunar south pole. Now, you might remember that a few years ago, NASA announced a number of candidate landing sites. That list has now been updated as the agency turned to science and engineering communities for feedback. The updated list introduced some new regions and scratched others. To select these regions, NASA's team evaluated several factors to ensure that missions to those places would not only be feasible and safe, but also had scientific potential. These regions were specifically chosen for Artemis III, and future missions may visit completely different places. After NASA determines the landing date for Artemis III, the agency will select specific landing sites within each of the regions. The mission is currently planned to launch in late 2026, but the schedule is likely to slip. Regardless, it's exciting to see NASA's plans to return to the moon growing more and more concrete. This week, there was a rocket on the move in Florida. Now that's usually not worth reporting, but this particular rocket was the first completed New Glenn first stage. Blue Origin moved this booster from its factory to Launch Complex 36. The company named the booster, so you're telling me there's a chance, as it will try to land at the end of its very first flight, and, well, there's a chance that it will succeed. But how does one move such a large rocket around? Well, Blue chose to employ a repurposed U.S. Army tank transporter named GERT, which stands for Giant Enormous Rocket Truck. Now that's a fitting name. GERT towed the rocket on its 37-kilometer or 23-mile trip to the launch pad. At the pad, New Glenn will be put through its paces, and up next is a static fire test, the first ever for this rocket. Blue seems confident in the rocket's ability, as it plans to perform this test with the second stage attached. We'll keep our cameras trained on LC-36, as this is a test that we don't want to miss. NASA has had a difficult time communicating with its Voyager 1 spacecraft. The agency lost communications on October 18th, after the spacecraft was commanded to turn on one of its heaters, which NASA believes then tripped Voyager 1's fault protection system. This automated system tries to protect the spacecraft from dangerous failures, and this time, it lowered the rate at which the spacecraft's X-band radio transmitter sent back data. A day later, communication stopped completely, most likely after the faulty protection system was triggered a few more times. Now, the spacecraft switched to its S-band radio transmitter. This one is less power-hungry, but its signal is so faint that the team worried it might not be detected by the deep space network. Fortunately, they were able to pick up the signal. While NASA is now back in contact with its interstellar traveler, the engineers want to gather more information before turning the X-band antenna back on. More of these issues have been coming up lately, as the aging Voyager 1 and 2 have been traveling through space for over 47 years. But thus far, engineers have been able to solve all of the problems Problems, so the spacecraft are still collecting valuable data in interstellar space. Now let's take a look at the space traffic this week and see what's coming up next week in spaceflight. Starting off the week, we had the first of three Falcon 9 launches this week. Liftoff occurred on October 28th at 2147 UTC from Space Launch Complex 40. The rocket was carrying a batch of 22 Starlink V2 mini-satellites into low Earth orbit. 
The first stage for this mission, B-1069, was flying for a 19th time, and it successfully landed on SpaceX's drone ship Just Read the Instructions. This week, we also had the launch of another crew rotation mission to the Tiangong Space Station, Shenzhou-19. Liftoff of the Changzheng-2F rocket with the Shenzhou-19 spacecraft took place on October 29th at 2027 UTC from the Zhouchuan Satellite Launch Center in China. On board were Sai Shuja, who was flying for a second time, as well as Song Lingdong and Wang Haozhe, who were both flying for their first time. Haozhe is the third Chinese female astronaut to fly in space. Shenzhou-19 then docked to the front docking port of the Tianhe module on the Tiangong space station about six hours later on October 30th at 3 o'clock UTC. The crew of Shenzhou-18 will now hand over command of the station to the Shenzhou-19 crew, who will be staying on board for the next six months. Going back to the U.S., we had the second of three Falcon 9 launches, this time from Vandenberg. Liftoff took place on October 30th at 12.07 UTC from Space Launch Complex 4 East, carrying a batch of Starlink satellites into low Earth orbit. This flight carried seven Starlink V2 Mini and 13 Starlink direct-to-cell satellites for a total of 20 satellites on board. According to Ben Longmire, SpaceX's Senior Director of Satellite Engineering, the company is just five more launches away from fully deploying the first constellation of direct-to-cell satellites. To date, SpaceX has launched 272 of these direct-to-cell satellites, although 13 of them were lost during the Starlink Group 93 launch failure back in July. This means that with five more launches, SpaceX would have, in total, about 324 of these satellites in orbit, completing this constellation. As Longmire mentioned, though, the company is not stopping there and will continue flying these to improve coverage and latency. This mission was also the 200th SpaceX launch solely dedicated to the Starlink constellation, with the company having deployed more than 7,000 of these satellites since the very first test launch of Starlink v0.9 satellites in May of 2019. The key to this success is, of course, reusability, and for this mission, SpaceX was using booster B-1075. This first stage was flying for a 14th time, and it successfully landed on Of Course I Still Love You, ready to be used again on a future flight. From the other coast of the United States, we had the third Falcon 9 launch of the week with, you guessed it, more Starlink satellites. Liftoff happened on October 30th at 2110 UTC from Space Launch Complex 40, carrying 23 Starlink V2 mini satellites into low Earth orbit. The first stage, B-1078, was flying for a 14th time, and it successfully landed on a shortfall of Gravitas. With the three Starlink launches this week, SpaceX has now launched a total of 7,213 satellites, of which 656 have re-entered, and 6,115 have moved into their operational orbit. And to finish off the week, and also the month of October, we had a Soyuz launch from Russia. Liftoff of the Soyuz 2.1A rocket took place on October 31st at 7.51 UTC from Plisetsk, carrying a military payload for the Ministry of Defense. While the payload is classified and has already been given the secretive name of Cosmos 2579, it's believed that this satellite is the sixth BARS-M satellite. BARS-M satellites are electro-optical surveillance satellites used by the Russian military to take cartographic and topographic measurements, as well as capturing high-resolution images. That Soyuz launch was the last one of the week and also of the month. In October, there were 19 launches worldwide, bringing the overall number of launches to 200, the second year in a row that there were at least 200 launches. The star of the month was, of course, SpaceX, with 11 orbital launches of its Falcon family of rockets, and we got an extra launch and landing thanks to Starship as well. It's also thanks to the company that the U.S. has had a total of 122 launches so far this year, with China coming in second place, with less than half of that at 52 launches. If this launch cadence continues, we should see the world reaching 240 launches or more by the end of the year. Pretty mind-boggling, to say the least. Going into next week, we'll have even more launches, of course, starting with none other than Falcon 9. The first launch next week, Starlink Group 677, is set to take place from Florida within a four-hour launch window that opens on November 3rd at 2157 UTC. Just half a day later from Japan, we'll have the fourth flight of the H-3 rocket. This mission, carrying the Kirameki-3 satellite, has been delayed multiple times due to bad weather in the area. But if all cooperates, this one should launch within a 102-minute window opening on November 4th at 6.78 UTC from the epic-looking Tanegashima Space Center. Another launch that had been delayed was the next flight of Rocket Lab's Electron rocket, which is called Changes in Latitudes, Changes in Attitudes. The company has been able to set up for another launch attempt next week, no earlier than November 4th at 10.30 UTC. 
Next week, we'll also have the launch of a Soyuz 2.1B rocket carrying the Ionosfera M constellation of satellites, as well as some ride shares. The launch is set to take place from Vistachny no earlier than November 4th at 2318 UTC. A few hours later, from the US, we'll have another Falcon 9 launch carrying the next Dragon resupply mission to the International Space Station. The launch is set to take place from Launch Complex 39A no earlier than November 5th at 2.29 UTC. Dragon should then dock with the front docking port of the Harmony module of the ISS about 13 hours later at 15.15 UTC. Before that, though, the Crew-9 crew will be relocating their spacecraft to make way for this cargo dragon. Crew Dragon Freedom will be undocking from the front docking port on November 3rd at 11.35 UTC and redocking to the Zenith port about 40 minutes later at 12.18 UTC. From the other coast of the United States, we'll then have another Falcon 9 carrying Starlink satellites. The mission, Starlink Group 910, is set to take place within a four-hour window that opens on November 5th at 7.46 UTC. And from Earth, we'll go to deep space next week. NASA's Parker Solar Probe is set to perform its seventh gravity assist of Venus this upcoming November 6th. The spacecraft, which will be flying approximately 380 kilometers above Venus, will see its perihelion changed by this maneuver, the last one planned for now. And that's your weekly update of spaceflight news. I'm Alicia Siegel for NSF, and I'll see you all again next week to recap this week in spaceflight.